Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joined us for this exciting event in the life of the Migration and Food Security uh, Network, or MyFood, uh, which is an international network of over 100 uh, researchers from Canada and 14 countries in the Global South, and funded by a seven-year partnership grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Now, my name is Jonathan Crush, and I'm the director of the MyFood Network, as well as its parent organization, the Hungry Cities Partnership. Now, the launch event of this new MyFood website is also an important development in the life of our uh, fundamental goal uh, to link two major research and policy streams that normally uh, sit in separate silos and really speak to each other. That is, on the one hand, uh, international migration, and on the other, uh, global food security. As far as I know, this is the first uh, website out there which is predominantly focused on the food security of the world's over 300 million migrants and over 200 million temporary migrant workers. So therefore, uh, we felt that this was an event that was worth celebrating publicly. Uh, I'd like to begin by introducing my two fellow panelists, both of whom will be making presentations uh, this morning. First, uh, Jen Jong C, who will be a familiar face uh, to most of you. He's the Canadian Project Research Manager for the MyFood Network, based at Wilfrid Laurier University in the Balsili School of International Affairs. Uh, Jen Jong has a PhD from the University of Waterloo and is an accomplished researcher in his own right having published extensively on food systems and food security in urban China. Uh, Jen Zhang will start us off with an overview of the aims, objectives, and achievements to date of the MyFood uh, network. He'll then hand over to our special guest, uh, Jacob Burma, who is the founder and senior designer of the website design company Vibrant Content, uh, based in Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, Jacob studied web and graphic design at George Brown College in Toronto, and over the past decade has designed more than 90 websites for academic groups, charities, and other change-making businesses. He also designed the award-winning BSI, or Silly School website, with which you may be familiar. Jacob uh, is the designer of the new MyFood website, which will also be in line for some prizes, as I'm sure you'll agree, when you see what a great job he's done and as he walks us through the site. So I'll ask uh, each of them to present for around uh, 10 to 15 minutes, and we'll leave some time at the end for any comments or questions that you might have uh, for any of us, and particularly for Jacob. Uh, please post uh, any comments that you have in the chat function. So, um, after Jen Zhong and Jacob have uh, talked to us, I'll return um, to read out any comments to wrap things up with the digital equivalent of a ship launching ceremony by asking Jacob to do the honors and to send the website live into cyberspace. So without further ado, uh, over to you, uh, Jen Zhong. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, welcome everyone to the launch of uh, the new MyFood website. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, this is an international partnership grant project uh, looking at migration and food security. So I will use the next few minutes to go through some of the key information about the MyFood network. Um, so the full title of this project is South-South Migration and migrant food security interactions, impacts, and interventions. The project operates from 2021 to 2028. It's a seven year project. We are in the middle of the third year. Um, and uh, the project is part of uh, the Hungry Cities Partnership. Um, and and where you can get more information about partnership from our uh, website, hungrycities.net. I believe that the website the new, will be upgraded uh, very soon and online. Um, so in addition to this MyFood website we're launching today. 
The My Food Network is founded by 2.5 million partnership grants from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, SHRC, and also generous contributions from our uh, partners. <clears throat> so the relevance of the My Food uh, project really lies in uh, the global status of uh, migration and food security. Uh, while we have seen uh, a growing uh, number of uh, migration within the global south, which outpaced uh, the migration from the global south to the global north. However, there hasn't been a lot of focus on the migra international migration in the international migrant studies on south-south migration. On the other hand, um, international and internal migrants are a significant proportion of the 2 billion global food insecure population, um, and they face uh, series, series of challenges, including precarious employment, inaccessibility to basic rights and services, structural inequality, uncertain futures, and acute and chronic uh, vulnerability to food insecurity. Uh, what's worse, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated levels of food insecurity globally and in the South. So in light of this uh, global broad picture of migration and food security, my Food Network convened uh, a, a network uh, with 22 partner institutions and over 90 researchers uh, globally. As we are developing connections with new and more researchers, the network is constantly growing. In addition to the four uh, Canadian institutions, um, including Laurier, Bowsley School of International Affairs, University of Waterloo, and University of Fraser Valley, we also have uh, five uh, institution, institutional partners from Africa, uh, three, uh, three institutional partners from Latin America, four from Asia, and also six uh, international institutional uh, partners, um, such as um, IFPRI, SDSSN, IOM, ILO, um, FAO, and MIDAC. Um, this map um, shows the uh, the major cities uh, and the countries where My Food Network is operating. Uh, here you can see we have uh, African partners located in uh, Nairobi, uh, in Kenya, um, and um, and uh, Ghana, Namibia, Mozambique, and South Africa. We also have Asian partners located in Qatar, India. Uh, um, in Singapore and China. In North America, we have partners located in uh, Canada, uh, Mexico, um, Jamaica, and uh, Ecuador. The goal of the MyFood uh, Network is to design and implement a new and innovative high-impact global research and knowledge mobilization agenda focused on the neglected interactions between migration and food security within the Global South. Uh, Mindful Networks is the first international collaborative partnership uh, looking at the complex interactions between South-South migration and food security. So to approach, uh, to achieve this goal, uh, My Food uh, Network uh, have seven uh, major objectives, um, including revealing the links between South-South migration and rapid urbanization and food insecurity, examining the different drivers, dimensions, and vulnerabilities of migrants to food insecurity, providing insights into the food insecurity susceptibility of migrants in South-South migration corridors, and showing how the transformation of urban food systems is generating new forms of migration and precarious employment in informal food sectors of, for migrants, uh, assessing how migration and food system governance impact migrant food security. In addition to this research objectives, uh, the network also aims to build the institutional capacity of research organizations and networks. Um, and of course, we hope to train a new generation of scholars in both Canadian and uh, institutions in the global south. Um, my food uh, network, uh, um, will be carried out in five major work streams. Uh, we use five words to you know, label uh, the five work streams. Um, the work stream one, cities, 
and we focus on precarity, exclusion, and migrant food insecurity in urban migrant destinations. Uh, Workstream 2 chains, which is the one we are working on right now, uh, will examine migrants' roles and strategies in the informal sector of transforming urban food chains. Workstream 3 corridors will explore food security challenges facing migrants in international migration corridors. And Workstream 4 connections will analyze rural urban linkages by looking at out migration and food security in rural communities. And Workstream 5 controls uh, will examine migration and food system policies and governance that affect migrant livelihood and food security. So uh, here's a list of outputs uh, My Food Network has achieved uh, by February 2024. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, and the output is has been constantly growing. Um, by February 2024, uh, we have conducted 21 projects uh, in partner countries um, for Workstream 1, and there are 14 projects for Workstream 2 ongoing. Um, and in addition to this MyFood uh, research projects, we are also uh, um, working on a few related projects. Um, I would like to highlight the Women Feeding Cities Project, uh, which focus on building a gender transformative, resilient, and sustainable informal food sector for COVID-19 recovery. Uh, this is a project funded by NFRF and IDRC, uh, which is being operated in four uh, of our partner countries. Um, also, another project we're working on right now is assessing and mitigating the food insecurity challenges, uh, con consequences of COVID-19 public health measures on marginalized refugees and migrants in Canada, Latin America, and Africa. This is a project funded by uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research. Um, and um, the MyFood Network has been putting out um, a series of publications, including our own series of MyFood discussion papers. We now have 16 of them, um, and there are more coming. Um, and our partners uh, and team members have published uh, over 30 journal articles and book chapters so far. Uh, we also have four research projects and three thesis, and all these publications will be accessible on the new website. And Jacob will talk about some of the uh, interesting ways to locate those publications related to specific countries later. And My Food Network uh, also uh, puts a lot of emphasis on knowledge mobilization by organizing a series of events, uh, including the White My Food webinar series. If you haven't joined uh, before uh, in one of our webinar series, I would encourage you to follow us on our website uh, for the uh, new webinars coming. Um, we, we have 14 webinars uh, so far, and uh, most of them will be available to, uh, to on our website um, and uh, in recordings. And we will also have the 15th webinar uh, next week on the 26th uh, in the morning from 10 to 11, featuring uh, researchers from uh, our uh, partners in, Jake, uh, in Jamaica uh, talking about uh, research methods in migration studies. I would encourage everyone to register and attend. Uh, the number 16 webinar will be also, we'll be on, uh, in, the, in late March, and the information is available on our website as well. Uh, in addition to that, we MyFood Network has been hosting a series of conferences, workshops, uh, and for example, in October 2023, we had the International Symposium on Migration and Mobilities in South Africa, Cape Town, and a lot of our partners were there. Uh, in March, tw uh, March 20 this year, uh, this is next month, uh, we will have the MyFood Workstream 2 configuration workshop uh, titled Migra Migrant Precarity and Urban Food in the Global South. Uh, if you haven't registered, please do. Um, the, the, regis the registration information uh, will be available on the website as well. Um, for more information about the project, please check out our new website. Uh, Jacob will uh, walk you through their website in a minute, and also the Hungry Cities website. Um, and also follow us. Please follow us on uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, 
moving on empty, and also our Facebook moving on empty food and migration. Thank you. I'll hand over to Jacob. Thank you so much, Jin Zhang. That was a great overview of the My Food Network. I am going to share my screen and introduce you to the website. So there it is. Um, it has been a deep pleasure to work on this site. It's been a bit of a passion project for our team over the past, past many months. As you got a sense from Zhen Zhang, there's incredible scale and scope and um, global reach to what's happening. I have found this project personally super interesting because there's lots of uh, research groups looking at food security, but this is the first one to intersect global migration and food security together. And many of the projects we work on um, are kind of theoretical to begin with. Um, and so uh, a website is made as kind of a shell to house future content and expected outputs, um, which may or may not come. But in this case, you can get a sense from Zhen Zhang, there are so many outputs, there are so many partners involved, and there's just kind of an explosion of research happening in this area. So it was really exciting to work on this vital project. Um, and the idea was to try and organize the, this explosion of content <laughs> and make it more visually engaging and easy to navigate. So here is the website. It is live at myfood.org. I will take an, a last step uh, to officially launch it at the end of this uh, meeting. Um, but I want to, you know, the homepage basically gives a brief description of the project, recent news so you can join webinars or anything that's coming on. And then My Food Papers are kind of the signature publication of the My Food uh, Research Network. So those are featured here um, in addition to a link to all publications. So a fairly straightforward homepage that you can navigate easily. Uh, the heart of the site in some ways is the publication section. And you can see they're already in five different areas. The My Food Papers, which we mentioned, I think there are even some more that are gonna be coming uh, very soon from very different areas of the world. Uh, that are in-depth, deep dives uh, on this research topic. Uh, so you can see those here, and each one of them will have a brief description of Precy, as well as quick links to download um, the PDF or see it here online. We also have this kind of cool flippable book if you would rather just kind of flip through and read it at your own leisure. This is kind of what it would look like if it were um, on a coffee table somewhere. <laughs> so we've in implemented that functionality as well. Um, so it's easy to get through all of the My Food papers. Um, the, uh, so those are there for you to discover as well. There's, as Jendra mentioned, journal articles, a number of those, and also books and book chapters. Those are presented slightly differently because they um, may just be a chapter in a larger book that covers other topics. So we've included that um, along with citations. And you can kind of see these little indicators of uh, what country or city is featured in a particular resource. And those are, you can search for those and uh, find publications if you have a particular geographic interest as well, which was some of the fun of this project. Uh, reports are here. Um, these, uh, you can read summaries, and these are often publications in other journals or, or with other groups, and you can kind of quickly scan through those here. And then interestingly, um, theses are included, and there are three already. And what's interesting about this is a lot of time theses just live um, in academic libraries and never kind of go beyond <laughs> that uh, location. But here, that research is available as well to the network and to other researchers, so it isn't just lost. Um, so that is kind of the heart of the site, is to have publications and um, be able to discover those quickly. Now, Jin Zhang alluded to something else that we have done, uh, is to make uh, each partner country have its own resource hub. And so here are the partner countries for the My Food Network. You can see them all here. And if you click on one of them, you should get research, a research summary, but also by category, this is a quick way to say, oh, what are the My Food papers that have been produced specifically on China or journal articles or some of the other categories such as theses or research projects. So these are now gathered, uh, and if there isn't one, it just says not available. These are all gathered by country. Previously, this was a city-based um, kind of research hub over on the Hungry Cities project, but this has been expanded to entire countries. Now, if you find one you can't click on, for example, Canada right now, 
now, uh, that means it's still in development and there will be research gathered around it. So not all of these uh, doors open, <laughs> but many of them do. And you can have a look at resources. Another way to access the publications, um, if you have a specific um, kind of country level interest in research on this area. So that was fun to put together and is should be handy for future research. I won't walk through every single page. I'll let you do that on your own, but you can see uh, some of the people who are involved here with brief biographies, as well as the partner institutions that Chen Zhang showed, quite a large number of them. And I believe if you click on any one of them, you will be able to see what specific researchers at that partner institution have been involved. So it's kind of uh, a good directory of people who are connected to the network. Um, and if you find your name or face on there and need to change anything, you can let us know. Um, otherwise, I would say, uh, you know, Chen Zhang alluded to some of the webinars that are coming up and other events. A lot of these um, have taken place and you can watch the rebroadcast of previous webinars. Those are all gathered here, but some of them are still waiting to come and those will be placed here. So it's a good repository of actual learning events that have happened. Um, and then there's general news and media um, from the network that can be found here. And that those, some of these are still to be developed, but those are coming soon. And of course, a way to contact uh, the My Food Network. So again, I haven't gone through every single page. You can see some of the research project and the streams that Zhen Zhang alluded to, uh, but that's kind of a taste and overview of what we have done with this, again, explosion of content that is uh, coming into this website and being categorized in various different ways by publication and by location, and then the ability to search for individual researchers. Um, I want to take another minute to talk about a couple things under the hood that may not be self-evident from this website. You know, we've been making research and charitable websites for about 15 years. And um, one of the tragedies of this work has been to see how much research actually disappears from the internet. There's this sense with the internet that once you put something up, it remains forever and it will be there available to posterity. Uh, but I have seen too many research projects start, get funded, create websites, and then eventually fade away. And then there's nowhere for that research to go. Maybe again, it lives in the corner of a library or in a journal article. Um, but that's something we've actively tried to prevent with this website. Let me give you a few quick statistics on link rot, which is what happens when content online disappears or a link is moved and you can't find it. Um, so currently, 20% of all science and medic medicine articles online are unavailable. <laughs> Previous research you just can't get to. Uh, fascinating, all these stats are from the U.S. 50% of cited links in U.S. Supreme Court opinions are linking to content you can't get to anymore. 70% of cited links in legal journals. I don't know what's happening in the world of law, but their websites are not staying up for a long time. And then kind of the kicker is 98% of all content on the internet has disappeared within 20 years. So I just wanna kind of bring this moment to say, we've seen a lot of research sites and we've seen this 98% where beautiful vital research has disappeared. So what can be done about that? Uh, one popular uh, way to check for old content is the Wayback Machine, which you may have heard of. It's a nonprofit organization that has literally gone in and saved billions of web pages so that this content is not lost forever. And you can search and look for the old version of a site that may have existed before. But I'll say it's a very spotty archive and it's hard to get to content. And a lot of times the PDFs, which is probably the publication the thing you want, isn't available. So something we started using um, is called R Drive. It is a kind of world first in permanent storage and it enables you to essentially pay once and save things for about 200 years without them going offline. I won't get into the technical details on this, but you can um, have a look at this if you're interested. And uh, I have, and our team has also created a permanent version. <laughs> so not only are we launching the myfood.org network, but we have created a permanent version. It's got this super long, rather ugly URL, but that is designed to be bulletproof for a couple of hundred years. And it is a clone of the existing site and it is interactive the way the existing site is and the publications are there and they, you know, you can even use the flipbook here um, in perpetuity and you can download the reports. So uh, again, this is kind of behind the scenes, you don't see it, but if the content 
should ever disappear or anything should happen, there is a version of this research that will live on uh, for centuries, hopefully. And so it's a nice archive of the existing content. I would commend it to any of you who are researching to think about that and find ways to keep your content for a long time. Another important thing uh, for any research, and this is some other technology under the hood, is how do you know who's coming to the site, who's using it, and what they're doing with uh, the content on these pages? There are many analytics tools out there to be able to measure who comes to your site. Google Analytics is kind of foremost among them. It's very well known, but I would also say they've come under a lot of scrutiny in the EU and in other um, kind of user privacy uh, concern groups that are um, kind of suspicious of what Google does with all of the data. You essentially put a tracker on your site that monitors every page and um, it would not be surprising to me if that data is being scraped for AI tools or packaged and sold uh, to third-party companies where Google makes a lot of their revenue. So they've come under a lot of scrutiny. We've actually moved away from using Google, although it's a nice free platform with a lot of granular detail in terms of what people are doing on your site and even what their age probably is. It's a bit creepy. Uh, we have moved to another tool called Plausible Analytics, which is a privacy-friendly alternative uh, that's designed in Europe and is compliant with um, some of the strictest uh, privacy regulations. So you do not get a sense of how old the visitor is to your website with Plausible, uh, but you do get a nice high-level summary. Here is the HungryCities.net. We've had Plausible running on it for about a month or two, and you can see the number of visitors. They tend to come, I think these would be weekends, these troughs, and these would be the weeks, uh, so people are doing their research during the week and having a look and how people get to it and what pages are really um, most interesting to users. So my food is getting some clicks, the homepage, the slash is getting clicks, and most people are coming from Canada, although there are quite a number of visitors from India and other countries all around the world. You can also, with Plausible, um, take note of your file downloads in a privacy respecting way um, so that we know who is accessing the publications and what they're doing. So I just want to take a minute to kind of lift the hood on the site and say, yeah, it, it is a site. It is, uh, I, I'm pleased with the design. I'm pleased with uh, sharing this research with the world, but there are also some tools to help ensure that this research lasts for a really long time and also is, is respectful in the way that it monitors behavior on the site. So I will end there. And Jonathan, if you give me the word, I have a last step to be able to take to kind of clear the cache and actually launch it, but I'll let you uh, break out the proverbial champagne for that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, and a cyber ribbon, I guess, to cut uh, as well. All right, uh, thanks very much, Jacob. This is really exciting. It's an amazing job that you've done. And uh, at this point, um, if we were all in a room, there'd be a huge round of applause for what you've actually done. So, uh, this is very exciting. Thank you. And then it's 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 uh, just looking at it. Uh, it's kind of state of the art, which is which is wonderful. Um, so I mean that leads me to to some of the uh, uh, comments and uh, and questions. Um, and I suppose the first one um, is really about this idea of state of the art because. You know, we set up the Hungry Cities uh, website seven or eight years ago. It now looks incredibly um, mm -hmm. archaic, mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, to be kind. Um, and one can go further back and see how rapidly um, things are, are, are developing. So um, I wonder if you could just comment on how, you know, we have now this, this structure, this architecture, where do you see things actually going in the future and, and, and how adaptable is, is this particular website to, to the best of the new trends, let's say? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I would say the typical life cycle of a research or academic website is about three to five years. And after that point, things often look stale. That tends to be about the time when um, the technology has moved forward and you can kind of implement new technologies to showcase the research more effectively, or the design has gone stale because uh, visual trends have moved in a new direction. Uh, that said, some things that haven't changed since we started are kind of the base level platform, which for us is WordPress, which powers, I think, now over 40% of all websites globally. WordPress has kind of remained, you know, kind of a base level, and that 
I don't think would change in the near future. It still tends to be a very, very popular content management system. Um, and also we have changed our technique where previously we would try to find kind of the perfect design shell and then put all of the pieces of a website into that shell. And web design has changed so that now you kind of get, I don't know, more of a blank whiteboard and then you can easily adapt on top of WordPress, how design and other elements will shift. So um, I think the good thing is this site could change in three to five years without needing like as deep an overhaul <laughs> as it did right now. Um, I'll say one other thing, Jonathan, when we started this project, you asked me um, how AI was influencing my work. And that was probably nine months ago. And at that point I was like, well, I, you know, I, I still couldn't imagine AI replacing kind of the work of a web design agency and being able to organize things and classify them. I would say nine months later, I, I wouldn't take that statement back, but we are definitely using AI tools daily. <laughs> um, not necessarily to do the kind of high level work of organizing design style, um, but I believe you told me this logo was designed by AI. It's not a bad one. Um, and I have used AI and some of the images um, ex to kind of fill in content that was missing. Um, and so I do also in other projects, not in this one, use AI to help do some of the content writing or to generate ideas for new content on other types of sites. So that is definitely becoming a tool. Um, and I know that will probably, that train has left the station. So I imagine in the coming years, there will be a lot more um, AI derived um, content and influence in websites. But um, as of now, it's uh, <laughs> it's not a massive factor, but it is definitely growing. Uh, <laughs> No, thanks, uh, Jacob. I just want a quick follow-up on that <clears throat> in relation to AI. Um, one of the questions I asked you right at the beginning was whether <clears throat> um, the kind of bots of Google Scholar, which is a main reference point for finding uh, literature and for accumulating citations, uh, whether those bots would search this website um, and I asked the question because we do have a couple of earlier websites where despite our attempts to get uh, yeah. Google onto these things, one of them is a migration um, project in Southern Africa, it's been impossible uh, to, to, to get that. And so people searching for that, uh, those publications would have yeah. to find them somewhere else, like in university repositories or you know, people who are trying to make money out of them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I think that's one of the, the questions. But what I would say is you said that, you know, in terms of, and I think it's true even with uh, the Hungry Cities Partnership, that um, website that Google Scholar is actually searching that. Now, if we go to AI, it seems to me that a lot of the new, uh, I guess, apps or GPTs um, are kind of... Um, giving you the ability to, to, to actually search for literature, let's say. Absolutely. Um, and so will those actually, <laughs> some of those, I, I can't name, name any right now, um, mm -hmm. but I've come across three or four different ones. Yeah. Yeah, and you can train your own GPTs now um, on particular <clears throat> content. So you could um, essentially upload this site to ChatGPT and have kind of a proprietary one that just indexed this website and made connections. And that may be a value. I have had colleagues, uh, friends who have done that. I have not yet experimented with that, but that is the kind of thing that is coming and I think has a good use case because it may enable you to detect connections between the research that are kind of in plain sight because they're on the site, but may not be self-evident or yet haven't been made. Um, so uh, yes, I could see AI leapfrogging Google Scholar and becoming a go-to place. Uh, again, at this moment, there are enough AI hallucinations and misfires um, that that probably wouldn't be taken seriously by scholars yet, um, but I could definitely see the technology leapfrogging Google Scholar. And I would say Google Scholar is really finicky. Um, 
it did get to hungrycities.net has been discovered and we hope all of the new publications will be indexed um, and we are doing <clears throat> what we can to submit this site to Google Search Console and to put the appropriate things in place so Google Scholar will find it, but it, it is not something we can control. <laughs> so it is in their hands. Um, and with AI, there is maybe more a sense that you can submit content directly and have the AI trained on it. But there's often a lag. The AIs need to catch up with what's happening online and new publications wouldn't necessarily be added automatically. Mm. Okay. Thanks uh, so much. So uh, I'm just going to look in the, the chat here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a number of very uh, positive uh, comments. Um, Cheryl says, wonderful to see this new website. Um, Sam says, excellent work, Jacob. Uh, Ray says, this is superb. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> so and there are more uh, besides. So <clears throat> um, I'll just uh, go back. So Cheryl asks, is it possible for the country research hubs to have a second language? For example, for Ecuador, we have publications in Spanish. We'd like people to be able to find them in Spanish if possible. I think that would be a capability. That wasn't part of the original kind of scope of the project. We have done that for others, um, like the Gender and Migration Hub. Um, where you will see that there are different language uh, versions of the content and you can get to research just in that language. And that could be something that could be added to this later if um, there was kind of interest and there was kind of a body of research. In terms of integrating it so the one site was multilingual, um, that could also be done. I would just, it would require, I suppose, that people who were visiting the site would need to be multilingual as well. And in general, we find that it's good to have kind of monolingual versions of a site. But again, that takes quite a bit of work to uh, decide what pages need translation to get the translation done. Um, but it also may be possible just to slip in a few <laughs> Uh, publications that are in another language, I would let uh, Jonathan Zhenzhong make that decision if that seemed appropriate. But it, the, the, the platform is there to be able to do that and it can be expanded to be able to include other languages as well. Okay, thanks, uh, Jacob. Um, uh, Sam asks, <clears throat> how do we link the two websites since we may still be thinking that uh, we are hungry cities for some of the time. Yeah, we do have links here in the footer of, um, I think most pages, not all pages of the site so that you can get to the Hungry Cities Partnership. Um, and again, likewise, on the new Hungry Cities site, there are direct links to myfood.org. So you're <laughs> trying to build those linkages, but it might take some time um, to establish uh, that kind of connection. And again, yeah, this is kind of a parent-child relationship between these two sites. This content was originally on hungrycities.net, but just as you saw, exploded uh, to be too much for that site. It really has its own identity. Um, so we have built in some linkages back and forth, and it may be actually good because hungrycities.net is the primary kind of parent website to have some specific content. And we can also put kind of a banner across the top on every page to say, you know, have have a look at more research on hungrycities.net and same there, where there could be a banner to say, explore our new website at myfood.org. Um, so uh, we can kind of drive some traffic back and forth. But I think when the hung new Hungry Cities site launches, hopefully uh, very soon, then that will be more evident because the My Food content will have disappeared and uh, we can redirect people to the site. Um. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Jacob. Um, uh, Mulu from South Africa says, excellent. Thank you for your uh, hard work. Thank you. Um, could I ask you just to look quickly at the uh, the couple of things um, which I noticed um, on the, I think it's under the partners. And if you go down, now we have all of these um, partner institutions, but then we also have a, quite a large number of individuals who are at other universities. And I just wanted to, sh so that you could just point out how you can access those. Okay. Yes. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, 
So that's via that net. Uh, that this yes, link via via the Yahoo network, network, other university co-investigators. Co investigators. Co -investigators. Thanks. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Sure. I mean, to, <clears throat> uh, if you want to just click on, a, on one of those older websites, you can see how far things have got. If you go down to maybe click on, uh, let's say, AFSUN. Oh, if this is still live. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's how things used to look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the the Twitter logo before the bird. Wow. <laughs> um, also, we have uh, with us quite a, a number of um, our junior uh, colleagues and and scholars. So, I just wonder if you just click on the training um, tab. Absolutely. Here we go. Yeah. So we've put all past and present uh, postdocs there and uh, and graduate students. Okay. So we will, we will certainly flesh this out uh, from, and this is really just largely Canadian based um, uh, with some exceptions. Um, and we'll flesh this out from, uh, from our different partners. Um, just going back to uh, finally the, um, the AI uh, side of it under media, let's just uh, click on that uh, podcast. So uh, it is un right. Mm -hmm. So we're actually in the process of using an AI tool to produce uh, podcasts uh, from text. So okay. some, for example, of our, our My Food papers, uh, they can actually be converted into uh, quite. Uh, um, professional sounding and looking or sounding uh, podcast. So I don't know if you've come across the use of AI for producing. Sure, uh, it's like chapter 11 or book 11 or something is an AI reader. There's also another tool called Fair Protocol that does very convincing reading of text. Yeah, I, that will definitely be um, a use case for AI going forward because to, to have to buy the equipment for a podcast studio and you may want to you know personalize it with a bumper at the beginning and end <clears> but to have uh, a good reader <laughs> um and and you may need to monitor it if there's some tricky uh words that that it stumbles over but yeah i've i've been very compelled by I, book 11 chapter whichever tool that is that the variety of readers and how natural they sound yeah there's that and then uh, the, the one we've been looking at also allows say for example the author of a paper mm -hmm. they can record a sample of their voice and then it okay. turns <laughs> and no turns that into them, them speaking i think the danger of that of course it then becomes part of chat gpt's um data bank and you may find your voice appearing elsewhere yeah. uh, yes yeah. or being used for deep fakes very easily yeah 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 <laughs> exactly so we have to uh yeah that's where <laughs> that Okay, um, just uh, quickly one uh, further question uh, and some more congratulations. Um, Inej says, excellent, very thoughtful. Sean says, congratulations on the success of launch of the new and impressive uh, website. Uh, we'll make this the last question. Sam asks, what is the advantage of .org versus .net? Uh, I mean, both are domain extensions uh, that have slightly different shading. .org would connote more nonprofit um, kind of nuance to it. .net could be anything and was maybe a bit older um, style of domain extension. That said, HungryCities.net is pretty established, and I don't think you need to change it to HungryCities.org and that it's a crisis. Um, and I don't know, honestly, we had a few choices for my food. I don't know if .NET was even available, uh, but .org seemed to be a good choice um, today in terms of being able to kind of connote uh, research organ. And there's some funky domain extensions like .research or .school, but those are not very familiar in kind of the public consciousness yet. So using a simple short uh, domain extension seemed to be the best call here, but it's not a do or die thing. If if .net was available, I think that would be fine, especially because it's the My Food Network. Okay, thanks. I just make one final point for those okay. who who have, who have joined us, and that is that um, in terms of building content uh, for this website, um, please feel free to uh, notify uh, Zhenzhong of 
any events, any presentations you've made, uh, or forthcoming, you can put in the news, any any newsworthy um, types of, of things, anything on any of these different parts of uh, of the um, of the website, because we want this to be an active, almost sort of daily uh, updating uh, type of uh, information source. Uh, also, if you, as you go through it, if there are things that you you think could be uh, changed, you'd like changed, um, then please uh, pass along any suggestions uh, that you might have. All right, uh, I've read out all of the congrats as we've gone along. So um, one uh, question here has just come in, which actually is actually an interesting one, which I will I will pose. Um, we are planning to build an African migration data system, AMDS. Will you be available to assist us in establishing the site? So more business for you then. Okay. Jake. <laughs> yeah, happy to talk <laughs> offline about that. That looks very interesting and related to this work. So yeah, yeah. sounds great. Okay. So with that, uh, I'm not uh, never done actually a virtual uh, launch before, but um, <laughs> perhaps you could uh, do the honors. It would be extremely boring for you all to watch the technical steps to launching a site. And there's some before and after. But the one thing I can do, here's our server. I'm just going to clear all the caches uh, everywhere. And that should officially launch the latest version of the site. There were some changes, last minute changes made this morning, um, even to the thesis section. So it's lighter, Shenzhong, and isn't as dark. So uh, those changes should now be live as soon as this is done. All cache has been cleared. So that that's the dopamine you get for <laughs> launching the website. And I think it's officially live. And it will take Google some time to pick it up um, and Google Scholar even longer. Uh, but it's off, off in the world. And uh, we'll watch uh, the results on Plausible and see how it gets used. Right. Thanks so much, Jacob, for all the hard work uh, that you've done. And um, we look forward to you know continuing to interact with you uh, with on this website and Hungry Cities uh, as, we, uh, as we go forward. Sounds great. Thank you. It was an honor. I enjoyed work on this. Thank you. So um, just to say in, uh, in conclusion, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. And please join us uh, um, next week. Uh, you should get an invitation and register for the next uh, webinar. I think it's next Tuesday, uh, Chandra. Yeah, it's going to be on the February 27th, uh, February 27th, um, from 10 to 11. Uh, the Eastern uh, Eastern Standard Time. Right. Okay. So with that, thanks very much, everyone, for attending. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. Thank you.